Hello and welcome to the ICF webinar, Four Ways to Persuade ISPs to Invest in Your Community. Uh, it's part of our Community Accelerator Program, which I'll tell you about more in just a second. My name is Robert Bell. I'm co-founder of the Intelligent Community along with John Young and Louis Zaccarillo. The Intelligent Community Forum, in case you're not familiar with us, uh, is offers cities and regions powerful evidence-based strategies for growing the local economy, for sustaining that growth over the long term, and also for solving the problems that growth brings. And it's based on some 200 uh, experience with some 200 communities in our network and on about 20 years of consulting and research into their best practices for creating inclusive prosperity and the social and cultural strengths that come with it. We provide leadership training of which this is a sample and uh, as well as analytics and loud noises measuring community potential and progress, uh, consulting, conferences, content and an international award program. And what we're discussing today comes from actually one of the courses in our online training program, the Community Accelerator, Connectivity, the Foundation for Digital Opportunity, which is course three in a program consisting of covering issues from connectivity to knowledge work, innovation to engagement, digital inclusion to sustainability. And these are these factors all come from ICF's research over that 20 year period, in which we identified these as being the primary areas of focus for communities seeking to generate growth, to sustain that growth, and to, uh, to deal with the problems that come with growth. And working on all of these at the same time produces a positive spiral of toward prosperity in many cases where, in, particularly in cases where communities have been struggling for a long time to find what that magic secret is to prospering in this very strange and very special digital age. Today, we're here to talk about one of those, which is connectivity and particularly, of course, broadband connectivity. And there are three basic laws governing broadband connectivity in your community, city, or, or uh, county. First of all, well, more coverage is better. Second law is that more capacity and speed are better. And the third law is that lower prices are better. Now, these may not exactly light up the night like Newton's laws of motion, but I put them up here for a reason. And that is that communities vary enormously in their broadband uh, assets from a place like where I live, I've got 300 megabits down, about 100 megabits up because I'm very lucky, um, to places that are struggling to get beyond dial-up or struggling to get something that, that meets the FCC's uh, very low bar here in the US of 25 megabits down and three up. Regardless of where you are and what your kind of conditions you're facing, you're going to need a broadband strategy because your community is always going to need more. Last week, I was at a conference with a bunch of very earnest people ensuring me that unless you had at least one gig service with very super low latency, you were already falling behind. I don't know if I believe that because after all, they were in the business of selling fiber capacity, but nonetheless, I think it's something for us all to take on board because the one thing we know about communications is when you've got it, you always want more of it. So there are some other important things to think about when you think about broadband. And really we're talking strategy here, aren't we? Broadband is critical infrastructure. If we didn't believe it before COVID, we certainly have lots of reasons to believe it now. It's just another critical piece of, of civilization along with clean water, reliable electric power, roads that are in good condition. But Unlike most of those, those utilities, as we think of them, broadband is very definitely a private sector business. And that means that its operation is governed by the basic laws of the private sector. Attractive markets get good service from more competitors, which means they get a bit more competitive price. And that, of course, is because broadband is ultimately all about geography. It's all about getting the service to people. And uh, the reason that attractive, attra attractive markets are broadband are ones where many subscribers are jammed close together. So it's very inexpensive to serve them because you can put many more subscribers on every mile or kilometer of your network. There are also markets that have a proven ability to pay. So the ability, so, so the 
communities that suffer from pockets of, of poverty or uh, various kinds of, of uh, you know what I'm trying to say, are obviously struggling in this kind of marketplace. So here's the critical question, and it's not, it's not always where communities start, but it's a good place to start. How do you make your market more attractive to the private sector businesses that are facing the geographic and profit barriers that are also facing you? And the reason you want to do this, of course, is it's much better to use somebody else's money to create the network capacity that you need than it is to do it yourself with tax dollars or debt. And there's a very simple answer to this, which is find ways to reduce the risk for the private sector. You may not be able to do that enough to actually tip the balance all the way over, but you can make a difference. And cumulatively over time, that difference can be powerful. So let's look at some specific examples. These are five different strategies that we have seen communities apply over and over again. And they vary based upon how controversial and how aggressive they are. So the use of land use policies is tapping the established powers of local government to control you know, things like rights of way, all the way down to the bottom in direct competition where you decide your only choice is to go head to head with incumbent carriers who seem to be unwilling to invest no matter what you do. And picking the right strategy or a mix of them is about understanding the risk appetite of your community. What kind of political will do you have for change? How can it be sustained over time? And this is ultimately where you're going, right? You're going to be working not alone, but with telecommunications carriers, with property developers in some cases, with systems integrators who are going to work with you to achieve the result you want depending upon what you can bring to that party. So let's start with this whole issue of land use policy. Now, again, this is not controversial. You're using the accepted policy tools of local government to develop your broadband market in, in new ways. So here's a common strategy, if you don't want to rock the boat too much, to map the existing networks in your community, both wired, cabled, fibered, and uh, wireless, to find the gaps. Where are we not covering? Where do we have either holes or reliability gaps or service gaps altogether? And then bring that knowledge into the negotiations that you so often have with communications carriers because broadband is about geography, right? So whether it's a cable franchise that needs to be renewed, a wireless company that needs permission to site a tower, uh, companies that need permission to use rights of way to bring in service or not, or to upgrade service, there's a lot of opportunities to, to bring this knowledge into a negotiation. You can also look at your own policies because sometimes cities and counties find themselves in an awkward position. They naturally wanna charge a good price for access to their poles or to their conduit uh, because that helps the general fund. On the other hand, if that price is too high, they created a barrier to deployment. So it's really just, that's just a market study matter. It's going and finding out what are you charging? How difficult do you make it for people? Do you make it extremely easy? Do you make it extremely bureaucratic and difficult? How does that compare with, with other communities who have some, perhaps the kind of connectivity that you would like to have? Well worth put doing that. It's an interior study. It doesn't cost that much money. Another strategy that's been successful in many places is to require installation of conduit whenever you excavate your streets, which seems very low level, right? Your conduit is plastic pipe you're gonna put into the ground. It's much, much cheaper once that conduit is in place for uh, private sector carriers to run their cable or fiber through it. Uh, so by reducing their costs, you're changing the, again, the equation, and those costs are significant. Uh, the civil works involved in telecommunications typically cost about 80% of the total, right? So you, you can move the dial. And this is a slow strategy. You're going to put in one piece of conduit, you're going to connect, connect it to another, you're going to put conduit in various places, but always be thinking about how you can connect it into, let's say, a network of conduit in your downtown core where most of your businesses are located. You do enough of that for long enough and you end up with something that becomes, that, that makes it much more interesting to a private sector carrier to produce, for instance, optical fiber service for your downtown core. 
And this is one that, that I don't think too many places have thought of, but it's a really intriguing one, which is to change your building codes. Uh, you can change your building codes, again, on, on the normal powers of local government, to require broadband cabling in buildings and to require that it extend out to a point that the telephone companies call the DMARC, demarcation point, where it's relatively cheap and easy for them to hook that, that building up. And if, particularly if it's a property development with multiple homes, if it's a multifamily dwelling, you do create some interesting incentives for the private sector. And let's look at a particular example. This is Loma Linda, California in the United States. It's a small city, but a very prosperous one. It's in the Los Angeles uh, metro area. Big retirement community, obviously beautiful weather, all the things that we think of when we think of, uh, of Southern California. They decided way back in 2005 that they were going to be a connected community with 10 gigabits of, of, of network capacity. Now, I guarantee you that in 2005, nobody had the faintest idea what they were going to do with that, but nonetheless, they made the commitment. And they created what they called the Loma Linda standard, which was again, a building code. It required all new builds and any building where 50% or more of the property was being renovated to install that broadband cabling with a wiring closet inside and out to the street to that DMARC point I mentioned in the street. Now you might sort of shrug and say, yes, yeah, so how, could, how does that move the dial for them in terms of broadband? Well, in Loma Linda, they were getting a lot of property development. Big, if you've been in Southern California, you know what I'm talking about. These big, um, often gated communities being built. In three years, 12 projects actually went forward in this community, began development of their housing using the standard. So now you've got 12 fair-sized housing developments offering a relatively inexpensive way for a, a private sector carrier to deliver very high speed to their to those properties. Pretty interesting incentive for investment by the private sector in that community. And once they start investing, very often that wave continues. Okay, government network, number two on our list. Um, the, the good news is that pretty much everywhere, governments like private businesses are allowed to build and operate networks to serve their own facilities, in this case, government facilities. So we're talking about fire and police. And if you're running, if you own your own public water district, uh, electric utility, schools, hospitals, and so forth. And it's, again, it's, it's not uncommon. Here in the United States, uh, where I'm speaking to you from, some, uh, I think it's something it's like 34 states have some form of regulation on their books that makes it hard to build a municipal network. And not surprisingly, those laws were put into place at the behest of the incumbent uh, telecom and cable companies. But nonetheless, even in those markets, if it's just for government service, you can build it. And that capital investment is going to replace the ongoing telecom operating expenses that, you, that you're already incurring. And so as a result of that, typically what I'm, I'm told is the payback is pretty fast. We're talking about two, three, four years before you have paid off your capital expense and you're now just saving money every single year. It allows you to support some public services that you might not have thought of, for instance, the deployment of free public Wi-Fi throughout your community, wherever that government network runs, as well as it equips you now, you're running your own network, you probably have your own small uh, data center of some kind feeding that network. Okay, it's a great way to bring some new government services online. You've got a network to feed them into the public network, and you've got the, the, the knowledge and the understanding of how to do it. The reason this is important, the reason this makes a difference is because it really begins to change how incumbent carriers view the cost and benefit of not investing in, your, in their own networks in your community, if that's your problem, right? All of a sudden, they're dealing with a local government or they're facing a, a local government that's perfectly willing to invest in connectivity solutions for its own purposes. And they, by the way, just, you know, you just cost them a customer that tends to get the attention of the private sector and begin to change the conversations that you're able to have with them. So let's look at a particular example of this. This is the headquarters of the regional municipality of York in Ontario, Canada. And it's a regional municipality, which means that it 
uh, has within it 11 cities and counties that extend from the eastern edge of Toronto, Canada's largest city, on up to the north to what's called lake country, which is tourism and cottages on the lake. So urban, very urbanized, and also extremely rural. And the regional government serves the purpose of providing shared services to all of those entities so that they all save money on things like emergency, public safety, and so forth. Well, way back in 2002, 20 years ago, they decided to pilot this idea of a government network and they installed a kilometer of fiber connecting a few buildings, again, operated by the municipality, this regional municipality. And it was really successful. It got payback fast. And the municipalities and counties that, that are part of this larger entity said, that's really impressive. What else can you do? Well, that success ended up driving the development of today's more than 200 kilometer network, which connects, uh, of course, the region, regional municipalities offices, but also city buildings, universities, schools, hospitals, carriers, carriers, right? Because they now want to plug into this to get access to, the, to deliver traffic and receive traffic from all those entities. And also data centers, which now provide service, right? They now can provide data services to all of those public entities. And that alone is impressive, right? In terms of changing the, at the appetite of the private sector to invest, to connect. But they went a step further. It was very creative of them. I mentioned that they're very urban down in the south and, and west part of, of this particular regional municipality and extremely rural up in the north. So they created a public corporation to run this big 200 kilometer network. You'd have to have some kind of operating entity. And it engaged in fiber swaps with some of those private sector carriers with the, the big incumbent in the area. And they said, we'll give you, we'll just give you some fibers on our network to let you operate them if you extend fiber up into the north where, where we have you know, these rural, these underserved rural centers, right? So that's a very interesting idea. They introduced the idea of leveraging an asset once they had it, which again gave them powers and, and control over their broadband destiny they would never have had otherwise. Number three, this is a very creative strategy. You haven't seen used that often, but boy, when it works, it works. And that is to gather up the existing broadband demand in your region into a critical mass. So you, your community, your local government has a certain amount of broadband demand. It spends money with, with some kind of telephone company or ISP every month. Um, I, and you may not have thought about this, but you are surrounded by other municipalities, by other institutions, hospitals and so forth, school districts, water districts that do the same thing. So you actually have much more demand in your region than you are personally responsible for or aware of. And that represents a potential for leverage. So what you can do is to research and total up the value of all that telecom demand in this, what's called the MUSH sector, it's a terrible acronym, which is utility, municipalities, including all forms of government, utilities, schools, and hospitals, right? And if you do that, you figure out what that total is, and you say, we are now a buying group. Now, that's not easy. I don't want to make this sound easy. It's very difficult to get a bunch of organizations to commit to buying together. Right, they're putting their hands in in the fate of this larger group in terms of, of that procurement process, and that procurement is a big issue, and it's hard to pull off. But you get this greater spending power, which allows you to leverage the telecom providers and say, "Well, you either work with us or we're going someplace else." To get cost savings and service improvements, to get upgrades to the network, to get new or expanded network. So how does this work in practice? Well, let's look at an example. This is Westchester County, New York. Now in Westchester County, this is, you're looking at the city of White Plains in the south part of the county, is like many counties diverse economically. It contains some of the richest zip codes in the United States. It contains some extremely prosperous business centers like White Plains, but it also contains cities that are extremely poor and also rural areas as well. So you've got that usual mix across a broad area. And strangely enough, despite the concentration of business in this area, they have an area that's called the Platinum Mile because it's nothing but corporate campuses, all for some reason silver. Um, 
they were broadband poor when it came to the high-end services that business needs. Why? Because directly to the south of them is this market called New York City, where all the subscribers are jammed close to each other and they're very cost-effective to serve. So they literally could not get the attention of any of the incumbent carriers to help them with this problem, despite the fact that they offered so much, it would seem, in terms of telecom demand. So the county government, they have a, very, a strong county government in Westchester, went out there and started having conversations. And over the course of a few years, they were able to gain commitments from cities, from water districts, from school districts, from an electric utility, and from other cities in the county to, to pool their purchasing power to make that commitment. And as a result, they were able to attract a cable company, cable television company that had, was, was operating in the region and had decided that it wanted to get into the business of network build because it, it knew how to do it. Why not would they turn it into a business? So they bid on the project and they got the project with an important caveat. The folks who in the county said, here's the terms. You're gonna build this network, you're gonna capitalize it, you're gonna turn it on and you're gonna serve this mush sector, this buying group but we're gonna structure this so that the best you can do with us is to break even. You're not gonna lose money, you're gonna break even. And if you wanna be profitable, which of course they did, you're gonna to have to go out and sell to our business sector. Now, I, from a strategy standpoint, you gotta, that's pretty smart, right? They, they wanted the network to be successful. They didn't want it to be ultimately to be a closed network. They wanted it to be as open as possible to serve the economic needs of the county. And indeed they did. It led to a network extending throughout the county that's serving some 3,500 companies in addition to the original buying group. And it, of course, as always happens when somebody finally proves that there's enormous demand here and money to be made, the incumbent springs up and started, starts investing. And they now have fiber to the home and a lot of other terrific things that never would have taken place there, or at least would have been a long time coming. So, not an easy strategy to pull off. You have to have a certain density of, of businesses to, to pull this off of, of, again, these different entities that would form your buying group, but boy, can it be powerful. Number four on our hit list, and this is really the fourth way in which you can influence ISPs without necessarily going into competition with them, is to build public infrastructure, to build telecom assets for the use of the private sector. So what you're doing in this case is just redefining slightly the role of local government. We already know local government does infrastructure, right? It does streets, it does it controls utility poles, it controls conduit, it builds things, it maintains things. Well, in this case, we're gonna just push that across the line into telecommunications. So we're gonna build infrastructure for digital services and telecommunication services. So we're talking about building, powering, because you have to have electric power, and maintaining conduit under the streets or un with perhaps unlit fiber in it with wireless towers. There's a lot of different ways you can go at this. And then you lease it to carriers and to major businesses that have big telecom needs and are frankly want to, want to own and run it themselves. And you arrange it so the payments on those leases cover your capital costs as well as your maintenance and upgrade, right? And maybe even return some, some surplus funds to the general fund after a few years. Um, that would be the greatest outcome of all. This can be intensely powerful in changing your dynamic because you're reducing the cost and risk of, of the private sector in getting involved in your market substantially. Remember that 80% of that's devoted to civil works and you're stimulating competition without competing, right? Without going into competition. One of the, the most dramatic examples in the world is the city of Stockholm in Sweden, which started down this path 20 years ago. When they began to build their network, they had three service providers, two incumbents and a, and a, new, a new one. Today, they've got well over 120. It's probably much more than that at this point, all serving the people of Stockholm because they made it so cheap and easy, relatively speaking, to provide service. But let's look at some smaller scale examples because not everybody's the size of Stockholm. This is Dublin, Ohio in the US, part of the Columbus metropolitan region. I actually was just there last week. They decided back, and this goes back about 
15 years to go into a public-private partnership with a systems integrator um, there to build a fiber network they call Doublelink, good branding, that would serve the city facilities and also then extend into a dark fiber network for the region. So they started out with that government network. And then, you know, that was a pretty good play for the, their private sector partners. So they kept expanding it. Now, they're, what they're out there selling, offering is dark fiber. They don't deliver service. They just have the fiber sitting in the ground. It's called dark because you haven't turned on the lasers that light it up yet for other companies, in this case, the private sector or other companies to use. Now, what's really interesting about them, and, and this worked, by the way, economically, it was a great deal. They got, they, they got the services they needed. They got the money they needed. And what really was intriguing, however, was the, the capacity sharing deals they were able to enter into. And that doesn't become obvious, but what they realized was that they had created an asset that could give them leverage. So they began sharing capacity. I'm talking about actually fibers, individual fibers on their network with other municipalities, with research networks, with data centers. And I don't know why my system is suddenly deciding to start that, but you'll have to forgive me. Um, and with data centers, right? Data centers now are again, places where telecommunications networks meet. So that gives them an on-ramp to other networks and those other networks an on-ramp to them, as well as um, providing, you know, hosting and other valuable services to the organizations on their network. Now, why does that matter? And this, by the way, extends into the Columbus region, extends far beyond it at this point. It matters because it turned Dublin, which is a, small city of 50,000 people on the outskirts of a much larger city, it turned it into a real regional telecommunications hub. They began attracting multiple new carriers and multiple businesses driving economic development. The, the picture here is of a, a, a bridge of, that they built across from their historic downtown and into this new multi-user, multi-dwelling uh, uh, district they created called the Bridge Park. And so it's, it's a business district as well as a residential district. They have four more of them in development right now. That's how much growth they've seen in Dublin. And it really all started with this strategy. So it can be very powerful. And here's a rural example, right? It doesn't just have to be in a relatively dense area like this. This is Parkland County, Alberta, Canada. Now this is another one of those uh, regional municipalities that covers a number of other ones. And in Parkland, they are county sized. They are pretty developed in one part of it because they border with Edmonton, the regional cap, the provincial capital. They've got a lot of industrial parks, you know, reasonably dense suburban style housing. You go away from that and you get into the rural lands, the lakes, the country cottages, the summer homes and so forth. So and it's very rolling, difficult landscape. They were able to seize on the availability of a grant from the Canadian national government and to um, capitalize a set of communications towers and provide them with fiber optic backhaul to, to the internet too. And then they began to rent space on that to mobile carriers and wireless ISPs. Now, again, this is a play just like the one I described uh, the only investment those mobile carriers and, and WISPs had to do was to install radios in the towers. And again, my apologies, no idea why Microsoft is doing this to me, but it may be because I'm an Apple user. Um, and so once again, the costs for those companies were drastically cut and they were able to deliver service into areas that had been terribly underserved. Now, the, of course, this is the same. You know, they, leased, they leased that capacity on the towers and the folks in Parkland County designed their lease rates to give priority to their really underserved rural areas. You paid a lot less to hang a radio on one of those towers out in the boondocks, you know, in this beautiful area, but nonetheless with a very low population. And you paid a lot more to hang a radio right next to that industrial park. You know, that's good, that's good public practice, good public sector practice. And here's the kicker, right? Again, they, their capital costs were covered, but they were able to break even on their operating expenses, OPEX, in just four years. So they got their risks covered very early on and did a magnificent job at, at using wireless to deliver the kind of services that we'd all like to have. 
Okay, just about done here. And I appreciate your hanging in there with me. Direct competition is what you want to avoid if you possibly can, because you're not using other people's money. And yet, and yet, some places just have had to do it. They've had to compete head to head with their incumbent carriers because they just could not overcome the blanket opposition from those carriers. And they were not, because of their geography, they were unlikely to benefit from that kind of open access public infrastructure strategy or demand gathering or any of these other strategies. In many cases, these of course are rural communities and they benefit from something that's, that's special to rural communities, which is they very, own, very often own their own utilities. They own their own electric plant, they own their own water services. And they do it because in a previous gen several generations ago when electricity and water systems and wastewater systems were being installed, no private sector entity was willing to invest in them. So they did it themselves. And here we are again. The mission, of course, is different from that, that of a private sector carrier. Your primary mission, and it's clearest here, is to contribute to economic growth and quality of life. It's not just to produce revenue and a profit, although you must produce revenue and profit if that network is going to keep running. So let's look at an example of this. Bristol, Virginia in, uh, in the United States. It's a small city, rural city uh, on the southern border of Virginia. And it's home to a NASCAR trace rack. It's a racetrack, I should say. It's home to um, the Country Music Hall of Fame. And it's home to a lot of farms. It's home to a lot of farms. So it's extremely rural. And in Bristol, however, they do own their own electric utility, Bristol, Virginia Utilities. And so that utility, with the permission of city council, um, committed some capital to put optical fiber into its distribution and transmission, its distribution and generation network, right? Because that allowed them to control it better. This is something that util all, most electric utilities are, are doing and, or have done. Uh, and by better control, better information, they're able to reduce the operating costs, the capital expense they have to invest into it, and also produce more reliable service. So it's a real win. And uh, the city was really impressed with how it went and how they, you know, the improvements it made. And so they, the council said, well, how about a, let's network together our government facilities, right? And they did, and they got payback quickly from it and it worked extremely well. And then the business sector said, how about us? How about us? And so they studied the matter for a while and then they took a deep breath and made the commitment to launch public internet service. And there was a very quick reaction from their incumbent telephone company and their incumbent table, uh, cable company, which began them on a three year journey to courts and the legislature uh, over and over and over again to confirm their right to build a municipal network, which had been created by the 1996 Telecommunications Act. It ultimately cost them two and a half million dollars back then to do this. Uh, so you got to believe that they really wanted it and the people of Bristol were willing to get behind it with their tax dollars. And that's very, very impressive. It tells you something about the condition of broadband in Bristol beforehand. They also had the backing of some significant companies that had facilities or offices in that area that, again, had had to put up with a lot of bad service at very high prices. And it turned out to be a good investment. This is a happy ending story. They achieved a 62% market share, which obviously had a huge impact on the incumbents whose services were being turned off. Uh, they estimated that in the first five years, they saved their customers $10 million in what they were paying before. Again, a very happy outcome. They're delivering voice, data, and video within the municipal boundaries of Bristol. And they're also serving two adjacent counties with uh, voice and data. Uh, and this is, you know, they've become, again, a communications hub that other communities all around the area come to them and say, A, how, could, how did you do it? And B, can you help me? a very good outcome. So the takeaways from all of this, uh, what, you know, what can you learn from the examples of these communities? First and foremost, and the one that you never wanna let go of is you have options. Even if you think you don't, even if you're waiting for somebody somewhere to come along and help you, you don't have to wait. There are steps you can take that will begin to change your destiny. 
They may not produce results tomorrow. They may not produce results in two years, in three years, which is really challenging when you know, you're an elected official, for instance. And yet, and yet, they do make a difference. And if you champion them in the appropriate ways, your community will notice. The key is to learn to think like the people who you want to invest, like a telco, right? Help those carriers find low risk revenues through a whole bunch of different strategies um, and find ways you can make it easier for them to come in and help you. Um, you may not even like them, but nonetheless, they're your friends and you want to get the best out of them that you can. While you're doing that, even when you're doing things that are relatively low risk, keep your eye on, on political support. Uh, a lot of communities get into trouble because they get excited about this. Um, you know, they, they develop a great plan and then they can't get people to approve it because the, the voters are too concerned about risk. They're concerned about their taxes going up. They're more concerned probably than the, the local government is about that. They feel it viscerally. So you've gotta be managing that throughout the process. And here's perhaps one that surprises you. If you're gonna do this work, whether it's any kind of build, whether it's a government network, public infrastructure and on up, think seriously about including a data center in your plans, either built and owned and operated by local government or in partnership with another company. There's an increasing number of companies that have woken up to the, to the, the revenue opportunity in putting small data centers in places that are not tier one you know, cities. Uh, because the data center produces that magnetic pull. It provides services to your government, it provides services to your local businesses, and it's a place where other communications carriers want to plug in so that they can get a piece of that traffic as well, and then their networks, to some extent, become part of your network, right? And so you get that magnetic impact that makes such a difference, and we've seen over and over again. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of this presentation, which has been part of our Community Accelerator Program. As I said, there's six courses here on each of the six different ways to help benefit your community, as well as an introductory course on what this all means. Why do you need to take this action? More information is available to you at icfaccelerator.com. But before you do that, let's talk to some people who know a whole lot more about this topic than I ever will. They are Rob McCann, who is the founder and CEO of Clear Cable Networks, uh, which is based in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and Paul Leadham, who's the chief innovation officer at the city of Hudson in the state of Ohio, again, part of that Columbus metropolitan area. I'm going to turn off my share if I can figure out how to do that. Well, there we go. I'm going to hit stop share so that we can just have a nice conversation together. So, Rob... Paul, welcome. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thanks for having us. Well, yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be here. I bet you are. I am too. And if I, if I had my questions all set, I could start launching into them. But let's start with the easy one. Rob, just tell us a little bit about yourself and about Clear Cable Networks. So I've, I'm a, the founder of Clear Cable. We're a Canadian entity. And our real focus is building and supporting communities of all sizes, their broadband networks. We help develop broadband strategy and then actually execute it. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> uh, don't you want to say something more about yourself? What, what's, your, what's your background in, the, in this field? Because I think, you know, you, you are one of our resident experts that we turn to for a lot of insight. Well, I mean, myself, I've been working with ISPs and the internet since the 1990s starting with dial up through to, to where we are today. And, you know, what's interesting for me is to observe the evolution of technology. And uh, as we continue to build more, people consume more. And my personal specialty is to understand what is it that they're doing and why do they need more and how do we get them what they need? There you go. Paul, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and Hudson. So yeah, I've been with the city of Hudson for uh, several years now, coming up to 20 actually. Um, and I'm in charge of technology for the city. Um, so with that, I'm involved with um, all the innovation that we would do within the city on the internal side, but also on the external side too, to kind of do outreach with um, all the businesses, anything that's going on within the city on the technology side of things, we try to get involved and see how we can partner with folks within the community to do uh, what we need to do. Hudson is um, just to kind of give you some perspective on where it's located is in between Akron 
and Cleveland, about two hours north of Columbus. We've got 24,000 people living here, great schools, both public and private. We don't have a college, but we have what's close to a college with one of the boarding schools in town, which is called Western Reserve Academy. And it functions very similar to a college. So we kind of have that, um, that kind of feel within the city itself, which is nice. It's a bedroom community. We've got a deep history stemming back to the Underground Railroad. And um, we have been with the ICF for seven years now. We've been fortunate enough to be a Smart 21 community and twice top seven. So looking forward to discussion. Yep, well, let's keep going with you then. Um, Hudson is actually a really good example here because you have tried several of these risk redu reduction strategies before ultimately choosing to build a network for the community. So can you just give us a little bit of the history of Velocity Broadband there? I can, yeah, and um, <clears throat> I'll try and keep this as, as brief as I can. I know we're kind of, we're, we're looking to not go too long here, but we, we began back in 2014 um where we we had a growing concern within the business community of internet services not not being adequate they, they weren't providing businesses what they need um so as part of this process which was a growing concern in the community we were going through um a fiber expansion discussion with our city council to uh to just do as you said in your previous uh, presentation to actually um, get to our substations to, to kind of have our facilities all fibered. Um, one of the council members um, asked a very important question. He said, can we just serve our businesses with this fiber and fix this problem? And that's when the idea kind of got legs and it, it went from there. So as we, um, as we continued our journey, as, uh, as many communities like us had to do, uh, we first of all went to our incumbent providers um, who were at the time quite complacent, didn't really want to um, invest in the existing infrastructure that they had because there wasn't really a need. But the reality was businesses were, they were having problems and they would, because we were in between two major cities as such, they really didn't want to look to invest any dollars within our small community that's, that's pinned in between. It's as good as, as good as it needs to be in their assessment. So we went through the process to... Um, do a, a needs assessment of the community to kind of verify what has been brought to the attention of the community. And um, obviously it did prove the fact that we did have, a, um, have an issue within the city where we didn't have the type of technology and internet uh, that was required to serve our business community and also residents at the time. So uh, we went out, we looked to see how we're gonna build this. Um, we were fortunate enough to have an electric utility within one of our utilities that we serve, uh, which really helped us. And we put a plan together to actually build out to our business parks and provide services to all of our businesses within the city itself. Uh, we opted not to pursue a full citywide build out at that time. Um, we went with a more conservative approach to just make sure that we, we didn't overextend ourselves, which I think to going back to some of your references to risk before, Robert, I think that's that's very true. And it was something that any city council has to take extremely seriously, where to, to build these things out is a significant significant investment. Back in the uh, 2015, 2016 time, it was it was it was taxes that we needed to go about doing those things. So we we backed off at the time and continued to build and serve our our businesses. I think I'll probably talk in a few minutes about what we're looking to do with residential, but the mm -hmm. difference and what we were able to provide though was um, the customer service, having somebody that's local, um, that is instead of just being somebody that you would call a call center in whatever that city may be, uh, we're able to actually call people at city hall, go down to city hall and answer and ask questions. Um, we also had the biggest difference, I think, which has really become prominent in our business community is, um, the turn up speed. If somebody wants to get a service or change a service, we can do it in a matter of hours versus um, alternate providers that these things can be 90 days plus to do things that we can do in hours. So, absolutely. No, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, Rob, let me turn over to you for a moment. You know, I hear from city managers that the last thing they want to do is to build and run a broadband network. So, you know, what are the challenges for the city in doing it? And, and are there alternatives that I didn't, I didn't talk about in my presentation? 
you know, well, Paul pointed out two of the big ones, the cost and the risk, right? And I think those are big deterrents for city managers, but it goes a little bit further than that. Building out a, a telecom network is a challenge. It's difficult. It takes some specialized knowledge. It takes some machinery that cities may not feel that they have today. Now, I'd argue that cities do manage infrastructure like utilities, roads, bridges, networks of garbage cans and traffic lights. So it's not a stretch to see a city move into that direction, particularly ones who already have a utility in place. But it does mean actually building that technical acumen, right? putting together the components for customer support to be able to answer that call and make those changes in an hour, to be able to have the engineers on staff that are able to build, operate, support, and manage that network. And the reality is we're in a very, very competitive environment right now for attracting and retaining that level of talent. Mm. So I think you know the discouragement for a city manager is how do I get that machinery in place. With regards to an alternative, I mean, I think you've covered the whole gamut of, of things that are possible, but I might add a layer on top of that. And I think you straddled it with your public infrastructure and demand gathering. And that's really just collaboration or maybe even go so far as public-private partnership. How do you work together with the current environment in order to develop strategies that move forward, especially for cities who don't already have a utility or don't have the uh, ability to attract and retain those resources? There's a story from our, from our work. Uh, a small city in Kentucky ended up building a network because they uh, put it before the town, the town and at a town meeting, the local incumbent showed up and explained to them that they were basically too stupid to run their own network. And he said that passed overwhelmingly. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody didn't get the memo on, 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 uh, on government relations. So for both of you, you've probably covered some of this, but as a community is setting out, a city council is beginning to say, we got to do something. What are the, the most important questions that they need to ask themselves? I mean, Paul, you alluded to a smart question from one of your members of council, but what are, let's start. I mean, let's, and let's start with with you, Robin. What are the key questions that you ask that you ask or want people to ask when you're consulting with them? There's really three big ones. There's lots of little ones, but three big ones. And the first one is, what problem is it you're trying to solve? What exactly is the issue? Is it you have some residents who don't have access? Is it like Paul, you have some businesses that don't have some access? Or is it that you need to connect the schools? or you need to be able to reduce the cost. So knowing what your problem is, is job number one. But then job number two is to really get a picture of the landscape. Who is already there? Who are the telcos in your area? It's really surprising some of the markets we get involved with where you just don't know that an ISP happens to be operating because it's a small little independent who isn't making a whole lot of noise. So getting that, uh, that sort of inventory is job number two. And that inventory might also include some of your own infrastructure. What facilities do you have as a municipality that can be, can be made available? And then job number three is to figure out what are the roadblocks why is telecom not here? And many times we find that it's municipalities implementing, as I think you pointed out in your presentation, policies that are deterrents. So if we can find out, is there a policy that's a deterrent? Is there a geography that's a deterrent? Is there you know, some density challenges? Once we figure out what those roadblocks are, then we can work on removing them. So those are the three big ones for me. Interesting. Paul, have you got anything you want to add to that? Um. <clears throat> I think that he hit the nail on the head. I mean, those those really are the the three main ones. And I think that it behooves every community that would want to get into the realm of of building these types of, of networks to to conduct a, a, a real professional needs assessment where I think a lot of these uh, all these scenarios will be uncovered. I think um, you know, you are gonna see what problem does need to be solved you know what the other providers are are they not only just providers that are available within each of these communities but maybe communities that are close by that may be able to come into the community and serve too you know what what is their um level of aggressiveness of some of these isps as well you know what are they willing to um sacrifice in order to come and work for 
with some of these communities to, to kind of have that combined goal, which you alluded to the, the P3, the public private partnership it is really starting to, 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 to kind of move along now. And obviously verifying speeds within communities as well to ensure that, you know, do we really need this or are we pretty well <laughs> served? All those types of things. I've kind of reiterated, reiterated what you said, Rob, but I think you, you, you answered it exactly the way I, what, what problem it needs to be solved is, is, is the key. So it's always a good place to start. Um, Paul, so, you know, you mentioned that you started out as a business only service. Uh, I happen to know from your website, you now offer a one gig service to residents. So what, what sparked that change and, and uh, how's it going? So um, it's, it's going well, it's going slow. What, what we did initially is we did build a, a business only network. Um, but in the process of doing so, we, um, we created an infrastructure which spanned a significant portion of the city. It's, it's not border to border, but it, it did go to all of our business parks. So what happened is <clears throat> internally, a lot of the things that you had talked about um, in terms of our leadership and guidance that they weren't, they didn't have the appetite for the huge investment to build resident residential fiber, but residents know that there's fiber going down the street. They know it's at the doorstop. So it was kind of um, the growing number of requests for access, obviously the pandemic effect. And the reality of we do have fiber in front of these households, you know, it's either we can tie people in um, or we can not. So I think that in, in terms of the understanding of our, of our leadership to, to, to see that we are gonna benefit the community by providing access to these folks that are directly connected to this, um, we managed to change our plan or change our direction as we kept going back, explaining to our council that we do have this need in the community, even though we do have two incumbents, um, they, they did get on board and said that we were able to start serving within a um, 300 foot boundary or proximity to fiber. Um, what we found that the, the fiber, even though there were incumbents that did have a, re a reasonably good service, that they every time that we did go to a neighborhood, there was 50% to 80% take of all these places. So it was extremely popular. Um, where we are today, our network is cash positive. It's covering debt. Uh, we are looking for alternative options to build out the remainder of the city. We have over 8,000 residences. 72% um, of them within the city still have no fiber access. So we know that that's a metric that we can use to establish our path moving forward. Um, when we initially started, we just had tax levies, revenue bonds were the real only options that were popular at the time. Um, now what's growing in, um, it's, it, it's growing right across the board is the public private partnerships. And now we really do have an infrastructure that is something that we have to bargain with when we talk to um, potential uh, our RFP respondents, you know, so other ISPs that will come in and, and look to build out infrastructure that the alternate investment um, realm has changed the popularity of fiber. The pandemic also helped that too. So now there are a number of companies that are looking to find communities um, that they can reduce their risk, they can reduce their costs, but they can also go into communities where we're quite fortunate to already have the, the ball rolling to say, you know what, we can come and help push this till the end um, because we can leverage what you've got. And we're, we're kind of looking to see how we can formulate a partnership where we can um, get the best of both worlds. So, so that's, even though it was investment for business several years ago, it really comes and it starts to compound. You've got to keep looking to see what opportunities are out there. And we're just going to be posting our RFP at the end of this month to um, to see what we have. I'm happy to come and talk and see where it goes. But all right, well, good quite exciting. You. Good for you. Yeah, very exciting. I, I love it. I love the I love the ways that acceleration takes place. Well, we're getting low on time, so let me ask you my last question, which really goes right to what you just said. Um, I was at a conference in, last week in Dublin, Ohio, and heard a, from a lot of fiber evangelists. You know, the, you know the people. It's fiber is the only technology you invest in, which is not a surprise when that's what they do for a living. But what's your view ultimately? Because I get this question quite often. You know, do we need to build a fiber network? Is that the way to go? Is it not? Does it matter? 
etc. So um, let's start with you, Rob, because I think you, I know you have opinions on this. Absolutely. I, uh, I once was told by an incumbent telco that copper got them the first hundred years and fiber is going to get them the next hundred years. So I think that there's no doubt that wherever you can, you build fiber, but also recognize that it's not the only solution and that in some places you will need to build wireless services and in others you might have to use things like low earth orbit satellites. So it's really taking the approach that I'm going to use the right solution for the right opportunity, but being fiber forward or fiber first. I remember somebody in Bristol talking about their, one of their problems. They've got people who live up in the hollows, as they call them, these very you know steep sided little valleys. And running a fiber up to one place on that, in that valley, that's just not gonna, that's not gonna work economically. Paul, last word to you. So is fiber, is fiber necessarily the way to go? Is it, is it, with, if you're not fiber, you're just not fab? What's the? Well, I think obviously as a CIO on the technology side, there's evangelists for any kind of technology that you wanna to talk to. And I'm, I'm sure that if they're looking for funding, they're, uh, they're gonna preach. <laughs> obviously that's the only thing to, to invest in, but I think, it, I would have to somewhat disagree. I mean, really from the perspective of, um, you know, is this, is this really the right fit for this community? You know, if, if you are, if you're going to be financing it yourself, what are you going to be sacrificing as a community, for example, to um, provide this fiber? You know, is it streets? Is it safety? Is it parks? You know, is it's really got to be a lot more thoughtful than just fiber coming to, be a technology investment. It's, it's really, it's the comprehensive intelligent approach to, to really finding out how, you know, how these types of situations are gonna benefit the community. I think one thing that is, it seems to be very popular now is that people are really starting to um, be more intelligent and in how they go about pursuing these types of technology projects. For example, um, you know, you've got dispatch centers, community centers, even within Summit County, which is the county that Hudson is in, they're looking to, um, to extend um, under the pretense of tech, it's communication, it's safety, um, that they, there's lots of grant monies available to build networks that, that feed these kind of things where you can, they're in the process of using ARPA funds, which is uh, federally provided funding through the pandemic and to kind of build out the rest of the, uh, the infrastructure, get it up to, to scratch, to, to build out a ring around the community to help safety forces. There's a, another place, another county within the state of Ohio that's looking to um, use grant funds to replace all their tornado sirens. So as a, a byproduct of building out these communication safety networks, um, they're able to put an infrastructure in place that is going to allow them to build out technology and all kinds of other attributes, bridge the digital divide, all those types of things. So the thoughtful approach is the one that really works. So interesting. Interesting. Well, that unfortunately has to bring us to the end. Quite frankly, I could spend a lot more time than this talking about it. But um, here we are. We only so far we can take our audience with us in this, in this, in this area. So I want to thank very, very much. Uh, Rob McCann and Paul Leadham for sharing their insights with us and I appreciate your spending some time with us learning about the Community Accelerator Program and our views on how you go about making, get, getting for your community the connectivity that you absolutely depend upon for a bright future. So for ICF, this is Robert Bell. Again, thank you for joining us. Take care.